I'd like to thank Rav Ginsburg. The first most important thing is anyone around the world who would like to ask us questions can go to the homepage of a class and on the top corner there's a link that you can send your questions. It's not too late, you can still ask your questions now. Any questions we don't have time to answer, we'll be able to send answers to hopefully by email. Also you can sign up and get the summary of the class, a notification about the next class, which is going to be on October 30th, coming up Bezrat Hashem next month. Um, Apart from that, it's two more important announcements before we start with the questions. The first is that as we get close to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the known given as Gulav, this way to get rid of all bad decrees is through prayer and charity. And on the top right corner of the homepage, there's an opportunity to donate to Gal and I to Rav Ginsburg's institutions and the spreading of a Torah, including this class. So please take the opportunity, Akirat Tov, saying thank you for the beautiful Torah we've learned tonight, and the Rav teaches us all year long, and please take the opportunity to donate. The other important announcement is that as we get close to the holiday of Sukkot, on the holiday of Sukkot, the Jews used to make sacrifices in the temple for the entire world, and Bezrat Hashem will have that opportunity to see if the temple should be rebuilt in time for Sukkot, and we'll have the opportunity to make those sacrifices. But just, you know, as a backup plan, if we don't have that opportunity, everyone can buy the book, Kabbalah, Meditation for the Nations. And this is a beautiful way to give your neighbors, your non-Jewish neighbors all around the world, a beautiful, beautiful meditation about how to become better, how to improve themselves. Um, you can buy these books for, you know, the rock bottom price of $50, including shipping, for 10 books. You can give a minion of your neighbors, your non-Jewish neighbors all around the world this unbelievable book. It's a great opportunity. And now we're going to start with the questions. I remind you again that it's not too late to ask. Send your questions through the link, and hopefully we'll answer them soon. By the way, people sitting here who want to donate and don't have internet can make donations at the back of the room. Um, we have, we'll take cash, credit cards, checks, and also a road keva, whatever way you'd like to give money. Galena is always happy to accept. So the first question is that uh, Judy from Toronto asks, from the beginning of the class, can I understand that according to Judaism, it is better to be a vegetarian or at least refrain from eating as much meat as possible? It's a good question, but uh, we'll leave that for Mashiach to answer who's, who's about to come. For the time being, there's a mitzvah, especially on, on Yom Tov, to, uh, to eat to eat meat because it, it, uh, it brings a simcha, brings uh, happiness, but uh, there are sages, many sages, that do say that perhaps when Mashiach will come, the whole world will, be, will become vegetarian. Okay, also people in the audience will soon get a chance to answer their questions, but first we're going to take from the people who didn't have a school to be here with us in Jerusalem, so we're going to take a question from Morris from London, who asks, does eating apples sweetened with honey on Rosh Hashanah have to do with the rectification of Adam's sin of eating apples? Can one extrapolate from the rabbi's teaching that it might be good to eat olives as well? <laughs> Olive leaves. <laughs> but uh, the fruit that Adam ate from was not necessarily an apple. An apple, the reason that we dip an apple in the honey and eat it on Rosh Hashanah because the apple represents the radiance of the face. So the two cheeks represent two apples, and the, when the face shines, that's a sign of, of goodness, and we dip it in, in, the, in Dvash and honey in order to, and we actually say and we pray, when we're doing it, may Hashem give us a good and sweet year. But, the apples represents the cheeks that shine and are joyful on Rosh Hashanah. Okay, we have a question from Boris from Moscow, Baruch Hashem. We've got questions from around the world. Um, the rabbi gave many symbols for the new year, and we have many more like eating apple and honey. Um, how do these symbols work? Do they really affect something? I always thought they were to keep the children interested in asking questions like on the Passover Seder. Every different physical object and uh, food has 
as a properties and as a different uh, values to it, as we said before, that, uh, that even science on practice and was based upon experience of generations and now there's a scientific research. Different things have different uh, positive properties. So not everything we know, but uh, if, if it's said that a certain food, because of its name, or things are created by the name, by its name in Hebrew, and most of the things that we eat on Rosh Hashanah by, by tradition, because the name has something to do with some blessing, some very good thing. So obviously that is, it's not just a, to, to make the children uh, ask questions like on the Passover Seder. It's something which is in, in, engraved within the food itself that it has a property to, uh, to bring whatever it represents, blessings to, to, to those that consume it with the thought in mind and to the whole Jewish people, to the whole world. I'll take one more question from, from outside of Israel before taking some questions from Israel, and then we have a few more questions from around the world. So Melissa from Francisco asks, is the inner peace that the Rav talked about as a foundation for our prayers also based on what we eat? If yes, what does the Rav recommend that we eat? And I must admit that I'm not a nutrition. <laughs> but, uh, but obviously it's... Uh, because of the information which is now so available to everybody, it's very easy now to, uh, to learn about what foods from a physical, and a physiological point of view are positive for nutrition. Obviously people with different, uh, every person with different uh, problems that he might have has to as to should have a nutrition which gives him his personal proper diet this off on the physical plane. On the spiritual plane, as we said before, there's things that are recommended to eat at certain times of the year, like Rosh Hashanah, because they have properties to them. It's called skulot. That even if it's not part of your daily diet, it's uh, definitely recommended to eat those things which are recommended to eat on these days. But Peace of, if, if the question was, does peace of mind depend upon diet? Definitely, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a very clear relationship. To, to be healthy, you have to eat healthy. And to have peace of mind, inner peace. It's, it's not that it's only diet, but diet is, another, is a part of it, a certain percentage of, of, of feeling good and being healthy. The real peace of mind, of course, for, for everyone comes with, with in one's mind and in one's heart, coming close to our Creator, to God, through the study of the Torah, through the performance of the commandments, through prayer. But Hashem told us, if He, if he made a point, if God made a point of telling Adam what to eat, so it means that it's important that you have to know what to eat, what's, 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 good, what's good for you to eat. Uh, sometimes being the master of ceremonies has its advantages, usually it has no advantages. But before we take questions from the audience, a very hot question I can't wait to hear the answer to came in from somewhere in Chutzarts, uh, I'm not even sure where, but it's ah, someone, named, someone from Los Angeles. Um, the question is that the gematria of a name Donald Trump, which is 424, <laughs> is the exact same gematria as Mashiach ben David, and the person wants to know what this has to do with the year 5777. <laughs> you know just as well as I know. <laughs> Come to your own conclusion. <laughs> okay, so we'll take some questions from the audience after the Rav's had definitive answer. Any questions in the audience? We have more from Kutsarts that I'd be happy to take. <laughs> so, so, someone asks from Saint, San Luis Obispo, California, I'm not exactly sure where it is, why is the bracha for grapes, Bre Priya Etz, but the bracha for wine, Bre Priya Gaffin? 
when grapes do not come in from a tree but from a vine? Shouldn't the blessing for grapes be Borei Pri Hagefin? And why have its own unique blessing? Well, this is a discussion in the Gemara itself that, the, that wine is so special and so important that it deserves a special blessing of its own. And the blessing is the Gefen. Gefen is, is uh, Given is the vine, as you said yourself. It's because the rapes are for the purpose of blessing. Would olive oil be edible in and of itself? It would also have a special blessing. But because olive oil, the olives are primarily for the oil, since it's not healthy to just drink olive oil by itself, it can even be dangerous. So that's why there's no special blessing for consuming olive oil. But, but the grapes are grown for the wine, and the wine deserves a special blessing. There's a, uh, a very nice thought that everyone can have. How the word gefen, which means the vine, the, uh, the, the, the wine, people that speak uh, Yiddish, so when they say borei pri they, they intend that the word gefen is a, also an acronym, the initial letters of gesund parnoso nachas. <laughs> that Hashem creates gesund, which much more means there's something healthy about, uh, about uh, wine, if you drink it properly. And gesund means healthiness, and parnoso means live, livelihood, and nachas means ha having uh, pleasure from children, from family having nachas from family. So that it's, it's all part of the wine that you drink. Gizun, Borei, Priyaga. God creates it. The health and the livelihood and the, the nachat, the pleasure from children. Okay, we have yet another question from California. Evidently, it's a good day in California. Very, a lot of, lot of people tuning in. From Abraham from Brentwood, California. What is the relationship between olive oil, pressed olives, and semen? seed as related to the sphera of Yesod, since olives relate to the sphera of Yesod. Okay, good. You, uh, you studied properly. You're quoting, you're quoting from Kabbalah and Hasidot. There are seven species that the land of Israel was blessed with. The sixth is the olive. And according to the spherot, that corresponds to the sphera of Yesod, which is the seed of reproduction. As we said before, the, the word seed is repeated, zorea zera, the seed-bearing grass and seed-bearing fruit, izuz pa'amayim, the twice that it repeats itself in the beginning of creation. So uh, there's something very, very important about the, the power of seed. And the, we said that the union of the grass and the tree is in the olive leaf. So there must be something very, very powerful in relation to seed and reproduction as well in the olive leaf. Okay, we got another question here from... Uh, the first one, the question is from Jerusalem, someone who didn't come to the class, Sarah, or maybe someone here sent a question by email. The, f the question is, Ayin Zayin is also an acronym for Avodah Zarah. How does sweeten this acronym? Good. But that fits exactly into the class that we said, that, uh, that, the sun, that at the same time we spoke about many, many positive things, we said that the Ayin Zion is a has to do with the rectification of King David and his sin. There are three great, let's say something that we didn't say, something very, very important. There are three great sins of the whole Torah. The first is the primordial sin of Adam in the Garden of Eden. Then is the communal, collective sin of the Jewish people, which is called the sin of the golden calf. And then the sin of King David. What is, the, what is the relation of these three sin, sins? Three great universal sins. The first is the sin of all of mankind. Adam represents and symbolizes all of mankind. Then is the sin of the Jewish people as a people. And then comes the sin of the Messiah of the Jewish people. The 
Torah says, Asher nasiachta, when the prince, when the king sins, there's a special sacrifice that he has to bring. Whoever has learned or heard of Sefer Kuzari of, of Rabbi Yehuda Levi explains that the Jewish people is the heart of all of mankind. In the same way, the Rambam himself says that the King David is the heart of the Jewish people. Sin has to do with the heart. We said that the olive leaf, first of all, supports and strengthens the cardiovascular system, which is the heart and the circulation. The Jewish people is the heart of all of humankind. The king is the heart of the Jewish people. Sin takes place in the heart, and, and the heart has to be made healthy, rectified through tshuva, through repentance. So the, of all sins, we sweat there are three that you have to be willing to give up your life for. But the worst of all is the Avodazara, which is the very opposite in, in any acronym or any hint allusion there's something, and it's a very, very antithetical opposite. The antithetical opposite of all of the good things of the O's of the good king is this O's which represents Avodazara, which was now pointed out. As far as sin itself, well, let's say one more thing. The universal sin is a sin against God who commanded not to eat from the forbidden fruit. According to most of the commentary, the sin of the Jewish people is the sin against the leader of the Jewish people. It's a sin against Moses. And the sin of King David, the sin of the Messiah, everyone has a point of Messiah in himself, the sin of the Messiah himself is the sin against oneself, which is the opposite of what we call the inner peace, the peace of mind. Once more, there's a sin against God, there's a sin against the leader of the people. And what is the sin of the leader himself? It's the sin against his very self, which is called Shalom Ba'at Samai, that he has to reach the peace of himself. What is the sin against himself? It says that Bathsheba was worthy, on high was intended to be the wife of David. But he ate her before she was ripe, like eating a fruit before it's ripe. Prematurely, as we said, that sins have to do with doing something prematurely. So what was he sinning against? He was sinning against his own destiny. Sinning against his own goral, his own mazal. But Sheva is the mazal of David. But by eating or by taking her prematurely, he's sinning against his very his own essence. So this is a very, very deep, uh, important point, that there's the sin against God who creates and commands. And that's the sin of mankind that has to be atoned for. And the sin of the people that does not have enough connection, and, and, and he kashrut is called, to follow the leadership of its leader and to believe a hundred percent in what the leader says. That was the sin of the, of the, of the golden calf. Comes the sin that a person sins against his own self-fulfillment. That's the sin of King David. And all of these three sins have to be atoned for and the atonement which takes place on Yom Kippur, the end of this period, that's the, uh, that's the rectification of, of, all, of all three things. Okay, I'd like to thank everyone for sending in the questions. We have a lot more questions that people sent in, and hopefully we'll have a chance to ask them next time in the future. I'd just like to remind everyone that this is a time to donate. Coming up to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, on the top right-hand corner of, this, of the website, of the homepage. Also, it's a time to buy books. And we look forward to everyone tuning in to the next class on October 30th, which is the next class next month. Thank you very much.